So good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Friday Hacks. So today we are very excited to invite Professor Manuel Riga to give a talk on SQL Lancer. So Prof Riga is an assistant professor leading the test lab at NUS. And SQL Lancer is a popular tool that can automatically find logic bugs in the database systems. So without further ado, let's invite Prof Riga. Anyone is already interested to try. So um, the project that I'm presenting, you can download it from GitHub and it's quite, it should be quite easy to get it to run just in case you want to experiment while I'm talking. <laughs> so thanks for the nice introduction. Also, thanks for being here today, despite the rain. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to present a SQL answer and this will not be a very research oriented talk. Um, so I basically try to focus on the tool itself and some of the concepts uh, behind it. So as already mentioned at the beginning, um, SQL answer is available on GitHub. Um, we also still actively maintain it and it's also quite popular. So if you're actually interested in uh, trying it out while I'm presenting, um, you can basically yeah, try to do so. It's uh, written in Java, it uses Maven as a build system. So it should be actually quite straightforward to uh, download it, um, use Maven package to build it. And then if you, for example, want to test an embedded database management system like SQLite, where the database system is directly included in the database driver, then you uh, don't even need to set up any kind of database system, but you can uh, just run it. So why should you care about a SQL answer in this talk? Um, SQL answer has uh, allowed us to find uh, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of uh, unique previously unknown bugs in widely used database management systems. This includes, for example, SQLite, which runs in all of our mobile phones. So there we have uh, found over 200 of bugs. Um, also as part of uh, this work, I have reported, I think by now more than uh, 500 unique uh, bugs myself. And also SQL answer is actually quite production ready in the sense that it supports various different um, database systems. So the main repository uh, supports already 19 different ones. And there are also some um, implementations that are maintained uh, by companies. So also, if you want to have a quick uh, look, we actually have um, websites where we um, have an overview of these bugs. For example, here on my own website or also here on Xinjiang Bar's website. So he has found a lot of additional bugs that were overlooked by early versions of uh, SQL Answer. And um, if you, for example, search on GitHub, you can also see that some companies uh, have successfully used it. So here, uh, Starrocks, which is one um, a popular database system company, they actually used it to find here uh, more than 300 um, bugs in the system. So I think I've motivated um, SQL answer enough. Um, what can you expect from this talk? First of all, um, I want to show you how SQL answer um, works. And um, then I also want to, on a conceptual level, basically show how fuzzing, which is basically the process of generating um, data, perhaps uh, randomly or in a systematic way, cannot only be used to find um, crash bugs, uh, but also more deeper kind of bugs, namely uh, correctness bugs. So with that, basically the talk will cover two parts, the first part will be a bit on the theory um, behind um, SQL answer. And then the second uh, part will actually be a live demo where I demonstrate SQL answer both from a user perspective and then also from a developer perspective. So a tool like SQL answer basically needs to tackle two uh, main challenges. The first one is that we need to generate an effective test case. And in our example, or in our case, um, this means that we want to generate a database and a, then a query. And um, if we actually look what's already out there in terms of tools, we might find, for example, a SQL Smith, which is a highly effective and widely used random query generation tool. So also this tool has been very effective in finding various bugs. Um, but it's mainly focused on crash bugs, right? So bugs that basically cause the database system to crash. But we can use a similar random generation approach to basically 
generate um, these databases and queries. So for the purposes of this talk, I will just assume that we already have some random database and query. If you're actually interested, um, very recently, Chin Zhang, um, who is a PhD student in my lab, he came up with a better approach on how to generate test cases in a um, more efficient kind of way. In this talk, I want to focus on the second problem, um, which is the so-called test oracle problem. And if we look at the definition of what the test oracle is, so I assume that this term is not very widely known. It's basically the mechanism that allows us to judge whether some kind of test case um, has passed or failed. And I would argue that this is actually quite um, difficult, even if we have some manually written test case and we want to find out what the expected result is. So we'll give a motivating example for this shortly. Now in terms of testing approach um, in this talk, I want to present a journey logic partitioning, which tackles this test oracle problem um, and I believe this is still the state-of-the-art approach in finding logic bugs, correctness bugs in database systems. So, oh, by the way, if there are any uh, questions at any point, just feel free to shout out and interrupt me. Um, like, it's very welcome. So you can see a test case um, that we created, that we generated using SQL answer. You can basically see here that we already have uh, two tables, T0 and T1 and it contains uh, two suspicious values, namely a zero and minus zero. Right, and then we want to fetch the cross product of all values from T0 and T1 where these columns evaluate to the same value. Now, does anyone want to guess what the expected result is of this query? Yeah, I think most people are hesitant because it's actually quite disputable, right? Whether the predicate here should evaluate to true or false. Because if you, for example, look at the binary representation of these two floating point numbers, then we realize that the sign bit differs, right? There is a, a zero and a, a one for the sign bit. And based on this, it might be that this predicate reads to false. And in this case, MySQL would return an empty result. But um, it's also plausible that the predicate reads to true here because this is actually the semantics that uh, most pro languages like uh, C or Java provide. So what's the expected result? Um, at this point of the talk, you just have to trust me. <laughs> Basically, MySQL was expected to let this predicate relate to true and thus uh, return the row. But when we tested the latest version of uh, MySQL, it still failed to do so. So we uh, found this bug, we reported it to developers who then fixed it for the next uh, release of MySQL. But the point that I'm actually trying to make here is that we could even find and report this bug without having an accurate understanding ourselves whether the predicate should relate to true or to false. And this is um, what I'm going to uh, present next, how we achieve this. So, this um, test oracle that we proposed in this work uh, is called Ternary uh, Logic Partitioning, or short TLB. And it's based on a more general idea that we called uh, query partitioning. So let me first briefly um, explain query partitioning. It's a bit theoretical, but I will, it becomes very practical very soon. So the idea is basically that we have a random query that we call the original query. And you can see here that this circle denotes the query's result set. And then the idea is that we derive multiple so-called partitioning queries, uh, each of which computes a so-called partition. And then we have some kind of composition operator that basically takes these individual partitions and combines them to a new result set. An assumption is that we can basically implement this um, in such a way that the original queries result set and the partitioning queries, um, the combined partitioning queries, uh, partitions, sorry, um, compute the same result. If that's the case, then everything seems to work correctly. If there is any discrepancy, then we basically found a bug in the system. Right, so that was a bit abstract because I still didn't tell you how we can actually define these partitioning queries or the uh, composition operator. So let me tell you this uh, next. And there I actually want to first uh, explain this based on an analogy uh, before uh, explaining how it actually works for SQL. 
So I'm actually quite uh, new in Singapore. I moved um, eight months ago uh, from Europe. And one thing that I learned to love here are the dragon fruits, right? They're very hard to get uh, in Europe. And what I also found is that there are, of course, um, red and white dragon fruits, but it's quite difficult from the outside to tell, at least for me. Now, who can actually tell the difference between red and white dragon fruits from, the, from just looking at the outside? Show of hands. No one? OK, that's, that's disappointing. <laughs> no. But let's assume that um, I ask you, and actually one of you can tell the difference, right? Because there are some clear differences, for example, in terms of the scales, in terms of the skin. Uh, so it should actually be able to, should be possible to tell them apart. But how can I test um, whether other people can tell the difference without even being able to do so myself? Right? That's the problem that I'm having here. And the strategy that I would use is I was basically um, given a bowl with red and white dragon fruits. I would basically ask you to first bring me all the red dragon fruits, and you would go ahead and perhaps um, bring back two of them. I would then put them back into the bowl, shuffle them around, and then ask you to bring me all but the red dragon fruits. And again, you would perhaps go ahead and bring back, uh, let's say, four of them. And if you paid attention, I think you already noticed that something went wrong, right? Because there are only uh, five fruits in the bowl, um, but overall you brought me back six fruits. So you likely classified a dragon fruit as both a red and a white one. And now I could basically tell that your understanding of um, red versus white dragon fruits is inaccurate, even without knowing this uh, difference myself. So, the more general insight is that every object in the universe is either a red dragon fruit or not. And we can actually further generalize this kind of insight where right? it applies to any kind of predicate phi. And now if you're talking about databases, then it also applies to, um, or like given some kind of row, not a fruit, exactly one of these predicate holds, right? Either the predicate roots to true or the predicate roots to false, meaning that not the predicate roots to true. And now since we are dealing with sequel, where it is not only true and false, but also null, we also basically have to account for that case by checking whether the predicate um, is null roots to true. And based on this insight, we can now, oh, and this are called the ternary predicate variants. And based on this insight, we can take now any data in our database, any kind of intermediate result, and partition it into three parts. Namely, those were the predicate that relates to true, where it relates to false, and where it relates to null. Now, how did this actually allow us to find the bug from the motivating example? Well, we first generated this original query, which here simply basically um, creates the cross product of all values from uh, T0 and T1. So it's basically counting the number of fruits in the bowl, right? And there, um, my SQL returned the correct result, which we don't know yet, actually. But um, yeah, it luckily did. And then you can see here that we derived these more complex partition queries based on this random predicate phi, which compares the two columns. And you can see that we have the non-negated version of the predicate, the negated one, and the is null one. And here, my SQL returned an empty result. Right? And this is unexpected because we constructed the queries exactly in such a way that both of these um, should um, compute the same result. And this basically allowed us to report the bug to the developers without knowing exactly uh, what went wrong. Right? We could basically report this uh, discrepancy. So this insight, um, I would say, is actually quite general. I just want to briefly outline what we did just now, right? We tested the implementation of work clauses by basically having this original query, then deriving these three partitioning queries that differed in terms of their ternary predicate variance. And then you perhaps notice that as a composition, uh, composition operator, we use this uni union all clause, which uh, combines records without removing uh, duplicate rows. Next, I want to show you how we can apply this to test um, 
one other category of features, namely aggregate functions, which compute the result over um, multiple rows. And specifically, let's first look at the max aggregate function, which computes the maximum value. And here, the original query and the prediction queries look just like before, right? But the composition operator is a bit different because now the partition is an intermediate result, namely the maximum value computed over the set of rows, rather than a subset of the result set. And this means we still need to compute the overall maximum value, which we basically do by just applying the max aggregate function again in the composition operator. To make this concrete, so here is a test case um, that we generated for CockroachDB. And you can see here that for the original query, CockroachDB returned a single row um, with a null value. And then we generated this partitioning queries where you can see that we computed the partition by using the max aggregate function. And then we computed the overall result in the composition operator using the max function again. And since this um, two results that were returned here mismatched, we are again able to report this back. Well, if we look at more complex uh, categories of aggregate functions, for example, the average, we basically quickly realize that a single value to represent a partition is insufficient. So what we're doing here is keeping track of the sum and the count to then construct the overall average. Yeah, just a quick note. So this um, technique, I believe it's, um, it's a very simple idea, right? And this is a good thing because um, developers at various companies like if they don't decide to directly use SQL answer, they can actually just implement it in their test frameworks uh, themselves. This, for example, here for CockroachDB, where they just implemented this TLB test and do their um, test framework. Great, so are there any questions at this point in time? If not, I will continue with um, the live demo. So let's see if that works. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that should be readable, hopefully. So basically, I um, already did the instruction that I explained at the beginning, right? I already um, downloaded, um, already downloaded from this um, GitHub repository here. Um, and we are now in the SQL answer directory. And of course, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to um, build a project. But there are a couple of dependencies, so all the chars for the database um, systems that we support. So. This will take a couple of seconds and now it's um, built. And basically in this um, target directory here, uh, we should be able to still see this uh, build char here. Right, so first let's just uh, execute it. Perhaps first um, without any arguments. I guess like most um, other programs, if we don't provide any options, we first get an overview. So you can basically see here that um, um, that we always see the database management system that we can test. So for example, this here is TidyB. You can see that each database system implementation um, supports various options. And then there are also some options that are supported by all database systems, which are at the very top. Let's see if I can scroll to there. Yeah, you can, for example, see like, um, oh no, that's still that's still CockroachDB. Yeah. yeah, a lot of options, um, but you can also see that we have some options that are basically supported by all the database systems, like the expression dev here um, for an expression that we want to generate. Now, the so next step, um, let's just uh, execute um, SQL answer and try to test one database system. 
So uh, let's perhaps try SQLite. And we need to specify the Oracle that we are um, testing. Let me just check what the name is. Yeah, we can see here um, this word test Oracle corresponds to this TLB word test that I just uh, presented. So let's use uh, that one. Great, and uh, not a lot is happening because now SQL answer basically in the background generates a lot of test cases. You can basically see here um, how many queries we have executed so far, how many queries we are executing every second, also how many databases that we are generating. So one uh, implementation insight that we had is that typically creating a database is quite costly. So we'll create one database, execute many queries before generating the next one. And um, perhaps interestingly also is this uh, successful statements here because we always generate syntactically correct SQL statements because we basically implemented these generators for a specific database uh, system that we want to test. But um, it's always, or it's sometimes possible to prevent semantic errors, which are for example, integer overflows, right? Because it might be a very complex expression and um, we don't really know yet if it will result in integer error. And this basically here indicates or explains why we don't have 100% uh, of successfully executed statements. So I'm just um, for now uh, stopping SQL answer again before it freezes my uh, system. So it's quite uh, CPU intensive. Um, and um, perhaps what we can have a look at next is that the, the logs that SQL answer generates. So there is this, um, oops, let me, But we have this um, logs directory here, and every testing thread um, creates one of these log files where it logs which SQL statements have been uh, executed so far. Perhaps let's just uh, open one. Oh. And what you can see here is at the very top, we have some information about the data system that we are testing, then typically we are setting some kind of predefined options. Then importantly, we create uh, one or multiple tables here. And then we try to populate the database with random statements, for example, inserts here, creating indexes, updating values, and so on. And after we finished setting up the database, you can basically see what I explained in the talk just now, right? We have here, for example, our original query. And then we have our quite complex partitioning queries where here we have the non-negated version of the predicate. Then here you can see we have the negated one with the not prefix. And then here we have the is null version, right? And overall this query and the one above um, should compute the same result. This is basically what um, SQL answer is checking here for this test oracle. Um, it's a bit boring because we haven't found any bugs, right? Um, SQLite by now has been tested quite thoroughly. Uh, we reported more than 200 bugs and all of them have actually been fixed. Um, so actually what we can do is we can try executing SQL answer on an older version of SQLite. So let's um, let's do that. Don't laugh at me, I'm using Teeny as an editor. Um, let's also here, you can see basically the version of SQLite that we are testing. So this is the latest version 3.40. And um, before the talk, I tried 3.27.2 which uh, still should be prone to a number of uh, bugs. So now I'm using Maven package again because Maven needs to update the dependencies for us. Oh, 
also here if there are any questions or if I should try anything, just uh, uh, shout out. So now I'm trying again the same commands as before, right? And hopefully we'll see some uh, errors. Okay, that was fast. So first of all, you can see that actually our JVM stopped executing. Um, the reason for this is that um, SQLite runs in the same process as the Java Virtual Machine. It's basically SQLite is included in the JDBC in the Java driver. And since um, we generated a test case that caused SQLite to access some out of memory location, we basically crashed the JVM here. Right, so this is why it stopped executing. But we're actually more interested in the potential logic bugs that we have might that we might have found. So let's check uh, the log files. And there um, we can see some files without this uh, suffix here that indicates um, it's a current test file. So this is a bug inducing test file. Okay, that's not an interesting one, that's an error one. This is also not an interesting one, but let's have perhaps a quick look at it. I don't know how to zoom in here, so let me copy this over there. Right, so here we executed the integrity check and found that our database is corrupted. So this is a, not a logic bug directly that we found, but it's also a category of bugs that a SQL answer um, has identified. But let's continue looking for a more interesting bug. That's also not a good one. Hmm? All right, but um, so currently I'm looking not for the test case that crashed the JVM, but for the one that um, we found using this TLB test oracle. So this might be one of the prior test cases that actually crashed. I can use scrap, right? Um, but I don't know the actual message. Uh, perhaps, uh, let me check. That's a good question. I think I didn't see it before, but um, perhaps let me try grab. Uh, I think it's something with cardinality. No, mismatch. Perhaps let me just um, try to do another run and see if we can find something. That's the good thing and bad thing, right? Because SQL answer randomly generates these databases and queries. So every time we execute it, uh, they are different. So I think I saw something above. But that was just a JVM crash again. Okay, that's again an uh, error bug. Not. Let me try one more time. Oh, I think now I saw something. Oh yeah. Now we have a good test case. Just need to find where. Uh, Oh yeah, this one, let me just copy it to another editor so the font size is a bit bigger. But here you can basically see that, um, I guess the message is not very user-friendly, but you can see that um, TLB basically discovered here a mismatch, right? It generated these two queries for this database and then um, there was some kind of uh, mismatch in the number of uh, results. So let me try to just reproduce this in the CLI. I'm just copying this because um, 
seems there was a regression with locking, so it's uh, not so beautifully part of the test case of the log file. Um, so let me execute the statements here in the CLI. So you can see here that we have this old version 3.27.2, right? And now I'm just going to copy the test file. And what you can see is here we got uh, four results, right? And here we got uh, a couple of additional ones. So there is some kind of mismatch. Perhaps I can actually try to make this a bit uh, clearer. So here, if I just try to count the, um, if I just try to count the records rather than looking at the content, the bug might also still be reproducible. And now we get back two integers basically, which hopefully still mismatch. Right, so you can see here that we have four records and six records. So this is um, not expected. Now, typically before reporting such a bug to the developers, um, it's important to try to create a minimal version, right? Because here we can see a lot of statements and probably many of them are actually not important. So what you can do, for example, is you can just randomly uh, delete some of them. Uh, and then check if there is still a mismatch. So here there is still a mismatch, right? We have four and six records. And you can basically either manually do this or it would actually be very desirable to have this part of SQL answer because in scientific literature, it's actually well, a well understood concept. It's called delta debugging. It's about systematically reducing these test cases. But as long as there is a mismatch, we still want to keep uh, reducing them. So do we still have a couple of minutes time or how are we in time? Okay, sounds good. Um, right, so basically now I demonstrated a bit how SQL answer works from a user perspective. Uh, unless there are any questions, I just want to do a very quick uh, high level overview of uh, how SQL answer is actually implemented. Um, there, so I already imported here the project in uh, unexpected. I imported the project in uh, Eclipse here. And the first that we're going to do is we open one of these uh, provider classes, which, uh, let me just check. Is the font size okay or should we make it larger, the back? Okay. So basically every database system implementation has one of these provider classes, which is the central entry point. So here you can see the provider class for DuckDB. And the first thing that you will see here is that we have a number of actions that we defined, which are basically the SQL statements that we use to generate the database. For example, inserts, uh, create indexes, um, creating views and so on. And if you actually look how they're implemented, then uh, you can just like uh, navigate to it, which is what I'm doing now. And here you can see that we manually specified like how these uh, statements are constructed, right? We start with an insert into, then we select one random table that is not a few because we can only insert in this kind of uh, uh, tables. So every database system implementation also supports some kind of um, schema support, right? That we can find out what uh, tables are currently present. Then we select a random subset of columns. Um, yeah, insert the table name, also down here, you can see some random values and so on. So basically we have such generators for each database system because sometimes the features differ a bit or the syntax differs a bit. One thing that you might also notice here is that we not only construct the curry, but we also have this um, errors object here. This is expected errors object. And what does this mean? Well, let's perhaps briefly go to the method that actually adds these errors here. And if we look, for example, at this first error here, 
we basically tell SQL answer that when it executes these insert statements and it encounters this not null constraint error, then you should just ignore it rather than um, showing this as a warning or error to the user. And the reason for this is that in general, it's actually quite challenging to generate tests or SQL statements that always execute without error. But right? it's, it's quite possible to always generate syntactically correct test cases. But here, for example, um, we don't know if we construct a complex expression, whether it ever leads to null or not. So we don't even try to do this. We just um, ignore such cases. But some errors are always unexpected. So if you actually still remember, before I showed you this um, mail from database, right? we corrupted our database, this kind of error is always unexpected. So in this case, as, um, if it's not specified here, SQL answer will still issue an error. Um, so this is how we generate this, um, this uh, SQL statements to set up the database. You can also see here that basically we have one method that um, provides some heuristics for how many of each of the statements to generate. Right, so here you can see we generate from zero to how many numbers um, the option here specifies um, insert statements. And SQL answer will always first generate the database by creating this table here. Um, then generating these different kind of SQL statements as specified above. And then if we see where this generate database here is called, we can basically see that as a next step, SQL answer will get a list of the supported test oracles, or actually the one that is specified on the command line, and then we'll just execute this test oracle for a number of times, again, as specified by the option here. Um, right, so I think that's actually mostly it. Let me just check my notes. Yeah, perhaps I can show you briefly how, how these um, expressions are generated. It's actually quite similar to how SQL statements are generated. So we, whenever we need an expression, for example, in a work clause, we have a number of operations that are defined and then we just um, randomly yeah, select one of them. For example, here, a unary postfix uh, condition or a comparison and so on. And we generate these um, more complex operations until a certain depth, and then we just generate a leaf node. So somewhere here, uh, yeah, we basically have the logic. If we reach a certain depth, then we will generate a leaf node, which should either be a column reference or a constant. So are there any questions uh, about this at the moment? Yeah? Right, so it's um, possible. So first of all, this TLB Oracle supports it, right? Because it's a black box approach. And um, specifically the implementation here, if we, for example, um, execute a SQL answer without any options, then somewhere at the very top, um, it should, for example, allow you to configure, okay, I should have done a grab here, um, but you can see here, for example, right, that we can specify the port, the password, and also some connection string to connect to some not locally running database. So it should be possible, basically. Any other questions about the, the demo part? If not, I will quickly wrap up with um, with another with two slides. Yeah. So, what if you want to get involved? Uh, so, we're always happy about any contributions. Um, it's actually, I think, always quite interesting to add support for a new database system or add additional features because most of the time, if let's say you spend one or two days, it's very likely that you actually find new bugs in, in systems that are not very well tested yet, right? So we actually applied also for SQL answer to be included as a Google sum of code um, 
project organization. So we don't yet know if you will get accepted, but um, you can basically have a look at the wiki page also to see what kind of potential projects you could work on if you want to get involved. So we also have a small developer community around this project. We have a Slack workspace. You can find the link in the GitHub repository. And for example, we're also on Twitter. Also, if you're interested like in a more scientific um, way in designing new approaches to test our database systems, you should also reach out to us. So some of us are still working on finding new ways on how to test database systems or related systems. Also at the beginning, I promised you that this talk will be not only about this specific SQL answer project, but I want to tell you that the, this TLB approach is actually a more general way of how we can test software. Right? Basically, we had our original query and got a result, which corresponds to a test case that we execute and get the result. And then we had this follow-up test case, this derived test case, for which we could then provide this test oracle. And this is a very general framework on how we can test software. It even has a name. Uh, it's known as metamorphic testing. So basically, if you want to find bugs in like any kind of other project, you can try to use a similar approach either by developing your own or, for example, consulting literature to see if there is any metamorphic testing approach that is already uh, available or has been proposed. Great, so to wrap up, um, I presented SQL Answer a tool to find uh, logic bugs in database systems. Um, one key challenge that SQL Answer tackled, which for example, SQL Smith um, hasn't um, focused on or hasn't uh, tackled is the test oracle problem. We want to validate whether a test case uh, produces the correct result or not. And here basically demonstrated this turning logic partition approach, which is applicable for, um, yeah, basically finding discrepancies uh, in the database system. So with that, uh, thanks for listening. So welcome back. Um, so we are going to start with our second session of today. And we are very excited to invite Professor Vashni to give us a talk on his journey in creating a battery-free IoT devices. Okay, so um, please. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, as, as uh, the introduction suggested that I've um, uh, uh, worked many years, last several, uh, I think all uh, for my PhD studies and my postdoctoral work, I've been working on this direction to design sustainable and ever less lasting IoT devices. So on Friday evening, you are going to listen to my journey uh, and what I'm planning to do in the group that I'm leading uh, called Visor at uh, National University of Singapore. So who am I? So I was born in India and I did my undergrad uh, graduate studies back in India. And uh, uh, that's where I developed interest in this area of embedded systems. And uh, my undergraduate project was actually about designing cameras that wirelessly co could uh, take uh, images of tiger in, in uh, darkness and then it can wirelessly communicate over long distances. So this project was funded by Wildlife Institute of India. And this was actually a very important project because uh, keeping track of number of tigers is very important. And one of the, like we have fingerprints, for tigers, the fingerprints is the uh, specific stripe pattern. So if you take images, it can help you figure out how many tigers are there in the wild. So at that time, of course, uh, that uh, we didn't really have all the embedded hardware that exists today. So this was sort of like my journey to design hardware. So this was like the first prototype that I worked on uh, in my, uh, for my bachelor thesis. And then eventually it became a bit more sophisticated and the cool feature about this device was that it could actually take images under dark by taking uh, uh, under uh, by switching on the infrared flash. And the reason was that you don't want to sort of like scare off the tiger or sort of like uh, uh, not disturb them with the uh, uh, flash. So it was taking it under infrared uh, region, which is not visible to tigers and uh, humans. So that sort of like was a project that uh, got me very excited in this area, and that meant that. Uh, uh, eventually, I continue to work, and it's almost uh, mo more than 12 years that I've been working in this area. And a lot of my work is basically at the intersection of computer science, electrical engineering, and communications. So if you are interested, uh, if you have backgrounds in electronics, communication, you're more than welcome to sort of like message me, and we can work on these cool projects. So 
these are all the hardware that I have developed together with some of the students who have worked over the years with me. And all of them have been presented at uh, flagship conferences in the, uh, in the area. And uh, many of them actually uh, can operate without uh, even batteries. So they, com they combine a lot of cutting edge concepts in electronics and uh, computer science to uh, achieve uh, these capabilities. So of course, uh, I went to Sweden and uh, it's a very beautiful part of the world. So it's uh, fairly cold if you compare it to Singapore. So the I was in Bangalore just before I left for Sweden. So it was 30 degrees. And then I was in Sweden where it was minus 20. So it was a transition of uh, getting used to the environment. But uh, I think it's a very beautiful part of the town. So this is Uppsala. So this these are uh, almost uh, the town actually uh, is around the University of Uppsala University. It's one of the oldest universities in the world. It was started in 14th century. and it's very beautiful and you can even see northern lights uh, once in a while uh, when the uh, solar activity is uh, at its peak. So uh, my doctoral dissertation there was around designing battery free and sustainable embedded systems. And that sort of like also was something that actually took me to uh, work at uh, UC Berkeley. So I was, a, my doctoral dissertation was awarded this uh, grant by ABB. So ABB is a leading company that actually works in industrial automation and they gave me this uh, interesting grant to actually work on these uh, sensors that can be in sticker form factor and that could actually operate on energy harvested from the environment. So that sort of like took me towards, uh, 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 and this was of course in pandemic, so a lot of it was also working at home in some respect, but uh, uh, that was sort of like the direction that uh, uh, I've, uh, it, it sort of like started a direction that I'm now continuing at NUS. So I joined less than a year back and uh, of course we know Singapore, it, it looks uh, much more modern compared to Sweden. So we have all these uh, tall buildings and and uh, I have started this group here. So there are a lot of undergrad students and uh, master's thesis students who are currently in my group. And uh, most of our work uh, that has been done previously when I was a postdoctoral student and, uh, uh, and when I was conducting my doctoral studies, they have been published as the flagship venues of the area. And um, a lot of our work is also covered by media uh, frequently. Where, and uh, it has sort of like also attracted a lot of grants from industries as well as for, from uh, national agencies. And, and uh, there is a lot of momentum around some of the research that we are working on. So uh, of course, uh, all of this actually uh, pre, uh, sort of like assumes that you already know Internet of Things. So how many of you actually know about Internet of Things or have heard of the term Internet of Things previously? So yeah, okay, this is still a large number. When I asked uh, some of the students who are in the course that I'm teaching uh, CS422, uh, so it's a wireless networking course. I think some of you would take it in your fourth year. I actually saw much fewer hands uh, than in this. So probably this is a better uh, venue to talk about IoT. So, so IoT is basically, uh, we all use these devices in our day-to-day -day life, right? So. You can you have these activity trackers like Fitbit that you uh, that allows you to keep track of how many steps you are walking or Apple AirPods and uh, this temperature sensor or uh, light bulb. So all of these are like great examples of IoT devices. And uh, back uh, 12 years back when I started to work in this area, so there weren't as many IoT devices around. But in last decade, they have become quite pervasive. So each of us are carrying probably things like earphone or. Uh, one of the activity trackers. And these are like small computers with sensors and uh, other capabilities that are built in. So these devices have uh, become quite pervasive and uh, uh, they allow us to sort of like uh, interact with the physical world and know about all the activities that we perform in our day-to-day -day life. So this is actually a very old sort of like forecast from uh, uh, McKinsey. And it's actually sort of like uh, said that the IoT is going to be bigger than the cloud computing. So last decade has been sort of like dominated by cloud computing and uh, it, uh, with all the big uh, uh, data centers and a lot of momentum, it has created a lot of economic value. And at that time, their prediction was that the IoT is going to be actually even bigger in terms of its impact and the economic value. That means uh, in terms of its uh, impact on the world, it's going to be even much bigger than cloud computing. So that was the prediction that they made in 2013. So in some respect, we are close to what they had predicted, but we haven't still got to the point that uh, they, they had uh, thought of that, uh, the, uh, what would be the impact of IoT. And, and one of the reasons is that uh, today the IoT devices have this something called energy challenge, and which is something that I'm going to talk about in this uh, presentation. So I'll actually start with this uh, graph. So we talked about that IoT devices have become quite pervasive. 
And this is actually a very nice quote, which actually says that roughly every decade, we have a lower price computer class that forms, and, th and that actually leads to new programming platforms, network and interface, and it leads to establishment of new industry. And this was actually back in 1972. And um, if we actually see in some respect, you would see that this trend has sort of like continued over time. So for example, in 1950s, we used to have computers which were uh, mainframe, which were, if they could potentially take multiple rooms and or even buildings. So they were really huge. And then we sort of like started to have this revolution where the personal computers started to become, uh, 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 at, at least in the more developed part of the world that they started to become more uh, familiar and uh, most houses you uh, started to have from 1980s, one personal computer. Then we started to have the revolution around smartphones. So uh, this started around uh, mid of uh, 2000s. And then uh, we uh, got to a point where everyone had one smartphone uh, that they were carrying. So these are, of course, uh, computers. So we got to a point where in, from having one computer per family, we started to have one computer per person. And now, of course, we are uh, in 2020, or and uh, we are at a point where we have multiple computers that every one of us is carrying, uh, uh, and this, including things like IoT devices, smartphone. So what is the future? The future is things like these smart dust. So this is actually one of the uh, uh, small autonomous IoT device that was actually designed in a lab in Michigan. And this is a totally autonomous computer. So it has a small solar cell, a microcontroller, sensor, and it is actually, this is kept on top of a nickel. So it's, uh, it's you can potentially have multiple of these small uh, devices on a small coin. So this miniaturization sort of like leads us to what is coming, which is you will have hundreds of these devices per person. So this is where basically we see, so we are now at this where we will have hundreds of devices per person that you are going to carry and, uh, and you are going to be surrounded by computers that are distributed in the environment. So while that is all predictions, so where are we right now? So this is uh, one of the estimates from a company called Arm. So how many of you have heard of company Arm? So several of you. So it, uh, it is actually a company that produces IP that actually goes into a lot of uh, different class of devices, but one of uh, their uh, important sort of like IP is these Cortex and processors there that goes into a lot of IoT devices. And in this uh, press release where they actually reported their fourth quarterly number, they actually, said that they had shipped over 4.4 billion Cortex and processors. And the prediction is that over next coming years, they're going to ship 180 billion uh, processors. So of course, this uh, rate of, uh, let's say the number of IoT devices that are using the processors is growing quite fast. So in some respect, we are sort of like witnessing some of the, what we had predicted that we'll have a lot many devices per person, but, but maybe not the scale that uh, we sort of like had anticipated that it will be hundreds. And the reason is, that of course we should uh, mind the hype as well that uh, these are all predictions. So we are seeing that it will be hundreds of devices, uh, but a lot of them are really useless. So this is a very good Twitter account called Internet of Shit, which basically talks about all weird IoT devices that go right from uh, very strange use cases. So, so of course uh, we should mind the hype, but there is a reality as well that most technologies go through these phases where uh, there's a lot of excitement then there is this plateau where uh, things feel like uh, it, they didn't live up to all the hype, but then there is a slow sort of like adoption. But one of the challenges that can actually uh, limit IoT devices, and it's also sort of like the focus of uh, my research as well as uh, uh, this presentation is that these IoT devices today, today has something called an energy challenge. And what does this energy challenge mean? So if you look at typically IoT devices today, so if you talk about the, the things uh, that you use in your day-to-day -day life, typically these are battery powered devices. So you, you have to sort of like go back and uh, charge your phone every alternate uh, day, depending upon uh, uh, how your usage looks like or your wearable devices, you have to sort of like re uh, charge them uh, quite frequently. And if you have IoT devices, you have to sort of like replace battery every few weeks or months. They also look like typically this uh, like small bricks. And just imagine that if you sort of like start to have this deployment of hundreds of billions of IoT devices and all of them are going to be operating on batteries, how would you sort of like replace batteries in these devices? 
And many of these applications that we talked about that you will have these sensors that are even in the form factor of, uh, let's say a smart dust or like smaller than let's say a nickel, many of them can actually be also placed in very hard to reach places. So they might be, for example, inside the wall or there have been a lot of research about having these sensors inside your body so that it can help you figure out if let's say something is going wrong inside your body. So it might not be even straightforward for you to replace batteries on these devices. And of course, it also limits the form factor. So uh, typically, the more capacity the battery has, the bulkier it looks. It also limits uh, how your devices uh, look. So in that respect, the, the energy challenge or sort of like this uh, constraint of these IoT devices to operate on batteries that require frequent replacement is one of the major challenges that, uh, that can limit uh, their uh, uh, rapid growth. And of course, it also has a bad effect uh, in terms of the overall sustainability. So you can actually think about having all these uh, the, uh, batteries being disposed of in a very large number, and eventually they actually go into landfills. And most of them are, are still using toxic chemicals, which can uh, negatively impact the environment. So the question that I want to ask is that, why do you think the, uh, these devices are power consuming and they require batteries or frequent replacement? What do you think? is the task that it actually performs that consumes most energy. So any ideas? Yeah, so that's uh, that's right. So typically, if you look at uh, the typical architecture of IoT device, so uh, it hasn't changed quite a lot in the last two decades. So it has this sort of like pipeline architecture. So you all understand what sensor is. So it sort of like allows you to track your physical world and it sort of like creates an electrical representation of the physical phenomena. And then it sort of like goes through these certain steps where it is processed the analog, our physical world is analog. So it sort of like takes these signals and converts it into digital form, processes it using a microcontroller and then it wirelessly communicates. And what we find is that the, uh, the communication is actually the most power consuming task and sensing is the least power consuming on these devices. So over the last two decades, the sensors, let's say accelerometer is something that you use to measure uh, motion or temperature sensor or even image sensor, they consume very little power. So it's at the order of few to tens of microwatts, while the rest of the components are quite power consuming. So this is actually a slide that actually looks at the power consumption for com performing, uh, performing computation. So this is actually one of the latest microcontrollers uh, from a company called Ambic. So this device can actually run at about 192 megahertz and it's sort of like uh, the current draw is about three micro amperes per megahertz. So under one milliwatt, you can have a 200 megahertz device that's, uh, 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 that, that is performing computation. And this is actually much faster than computers that were being used 10 or 15 years back, uh, about 15 years back. So if you just look at basically the current draw, uh, if you see basically that in two decades, we have received, uh, we have, sort of like improved by two orders of magnitude. So this was a microcontroller that was uh, uh, introduced in 2002. And this is one of the latest microcontrollers from uh, Ambic. And we see almost two orders of magnitude improvement. And the reason is that these digital components are becoming very efficient as they follow Moore's law. So how many, how many of you know about Moore's law? So I think, this, uh, yeah, I think some of you know, but for the people who don't know, I think you should go and read up because it's one of the, important sort of like uh, trends that have uh, dictated a lot of uh, uh, our computation in terms of what to expect. So what we find is that these digital components, including microcontrollers have become more powerful and very efficient. And this trend sort of like is continuing. So even the computation is becoming in energy inexpensive. But if we talk about communication, it hasn't sort of like seen this effect. So, so if you look at typically the power consumption of, let's say, microcontroller, it's hundreds of microwatts. Sensor we have talked about, it's few to tens of microwatts. But the radio transceiver or the device that allows you to perform wireless communication is tens to hundreds of milliwatts. So it's several orders of magnitude more than other devices. And why is that the case? So if you just look at, for example, a typical radio transceiver, it, has, it can be thought of composed of two different uh, blocks. So one block is uh, digital which sort of like have circuitry to allow you to generate baseband. So baseband is like the information signal and analog, which actually generates this high frequency radio waves. So the way wireless communication happens is that you generate these high frequency radio waves and you change one of its property based on the information that you want to transmit. 
So typically generation of these radio waves, which are these high frequency signals, that's the most power consuming task. So while the Moore's law controls the digital, uh, the energy efficiency of digital components and they have becoming energy efficient. So the way the digital parts on the radio transceiver has become efficient, but we cannot say the same about the analog uh, components. And it's these analog components that are part of these uh, radio transceiver that actually make them quite power consuming. And that causes your IoT devices to sort of like uh, have all these uh, challenges with their energy consumption. So what's the impact? So if you just look at, for example, uh, this is actually one of the things that I had covered in, uh, in, in the course uh, uh, recently, uh, the wireless networking. So if you look at basically a battery, so we know this battery, right? We have used it in a lot of our devices. So this is the coin cell battery. It's typically called CR2032. And typically the batteries are expressed in terms of the capacity in a unit called milliampere hour. So how many of you have heard the term milliampere hours before? So a lot. So basically it's a, it's a way to, uh, if you at a very sort of like high level, you can sort of like estimate what's the capacity and how long would the battery last by looking at its current draw. So if you have a battery, let's say this coin cell is rated 240 milliampere hour. So what it means that if you are going to draw one milliampere from it, this battery will last 240 hours. But instead, if you start to draw 240 milliampere, it's going to last one hour. So of course, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it. The real world is a bit more complex, but for the sake of discussion, let's uh, 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 let's sort of like keep this in mind. And of there are also batteries which are in the form factor uh, of let's say like a sticker. So these are uh, this is particular battery that is manufactured by this uh, company called Molex. And it has, of course, much lower capacity and it is about 10 milliampere hour. So it is, uh, if you want, you can just buy this battery for a few dollars. So it's a commercial battery, but it has a limited capacity. So if you just look at, for example, uh, these individual components that we had talked about. So if you want to sort of like have a microcontroller, uh, it let's say it takes uh, roughly a, about 200 microamperes of current. An accelerometer, about 10 microamperes. A Wi-Fi radio is 15 milliamperes and Bluetooth about one milliampere. So if you look at basically how long this battery is going to last, you will find is that I think that your sensors and microcontrollers can easily make these batteries last for uh, uh, tens of hours or thousands of hours, depending upon which battery you're talking about and what uh, component you're operating. But if you sort of like power these wireless radios, a Wi-Fi radio can only sort of like have this flexible battery last for about 45 minutes and a coin cell for about 16 hours. With Bluetooth, of course, it uh, draws uh, lesser current compared to Wi-Fi radio, so you can have it last a bit longer than the batteries, but still, it's uh, you don't want really your IoT device that you have to change battery every 10 hours, so that's uh, not really favorable. So it's really, the it sort of like uh, uh, pushes this point that the wireless communication really is the one that uh, we need to sort of like solve to for us to have these uh, devices to uh, last long time uh, without having to worry about changing their batteries. So, so that actually brings me to uh, one of the directions that I have worked on uh, uh, for my research and it's something called backscatter communication. So a good way to understand what backscatter is, is that if you sort of like have a mirror and let's say if you have a light incident on the mirror, you can actually reflect this light without sort of like spending any energy. In some respect, it's reflected of the mirror. And let's say if you are going to slowly turn the mirror based on information you want to send, you can actually encode this information on in the reflection. So it takes more energy to generate this light, but much less energy except for the actuation of the mirror to sort of like uh, reflect it and sort of like encode information. So backscatter is actually very similar to mirror uh, reflecting a light, but instead of sort of like reflecting light, you're talking now about radio waves. So let's say you have a backscatter uh, device, a Typically a backscatter device in its simplest form is basically just an antenna connected to a switch. So with this switch, you basically are turning it on and off in a way to reflect or absorb the signal that is incident on the device. So let's say you have this uh, backscatter uh, device and you have a uh, ambient RF signal. So the ambient radio waves that are around you incident on this uh, backscatter uh, device. And if you sort of like control the switch, so you basically turn it on and off, on and off, depending upon the information that you want to transmit, what you can do is you can generate these reflected signals from this antenna, the same way that you were reflecting light, instead you're reflecting radio waves through the backscatter antenna. And these reflected signals actually mimic the information that was sort of like uh, controlling the RF switch. 
And the reason why it is actually uh, significant is that this task of changing the state of the antenna to reflect or absorb can be done at up to 10,000 times lower power consumption than generating radio waves. So that allows these backscatter uh, radios uh, or to be extremely uh, energy efficient and it can be many orders of magnitude lower in power consumption uh, when you compare it to uh, the, uh, the radios that are used in uh, devices today. So this is actually a demonstration for uh, one of uh, backscatter systems. So the implications, what would be, that's something that uh, I'm going to cover, but let's look at this uh, system that was presented at NSDI. So it's one of the flagship uh, systems conferences. And this was actually developed at uh, University of Washington. So what they did was that they designed this uh, backscatter based uh, system that reflects ambient FM signal. So we have all these FM uh, towers in the city, which sort of like broadcast uh, audio and, re uh, and they, they were reflecting these signals and they designed these sort of like uh, uh, posters which were uh, uh, transmitting information and which could be picked up by the radio that is present in the car. So let me just play this. From APM reports. Just a note before we start, this program includes content. So in this In this project, we introduce a new wireless primitive called ambient backscatter.
So of course, uh, um, I think both of these examples actually were uh, example of systems that have come out uh, in last several years that actually demonstrate that you could actually reflect these signals that are all around you, which are being used for a specific purpose, but you can now reflect these signals and encode information and have this vision of devices that don't have batteries. And the reason is because this task of reflection or absorption is so low power that you can have these devices just operating on energy harvested from the environment. So while these systems were uh, published recently, so but backscatter as a mechanism is actually not a new mechanism. In fact, uh, the first backscatter system was actually demonstrated back in 1945. So it was uh, what it at that time, of course, uh, it was the, just after the World War, and uh, the relationship between U.S. and Soviet Union was uh, uh, it, it was uh, challenging. And what uh, what they did was that they put one of these passive backscatter devices behind a U.S. emblem, and they were sending all the audio information in a very low power manner. And it took them several years to figure out that uh, uh, they were sort of like being snooped upon. So that was like one of the first backscatter system. But you actually most likely are uh, sort of like using backscatter in your day-to-day -day life. So if you go to a store and if you sort of like look at the objects, typically they have these stickers that are a part of it. And if you don't pay and take the object out of the store, it starts to beep. So those stickers are actually typically using backscatter uh, 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 communication. So typically, if you look at uh, these uh, stores, they have these big uh, antennas that are at the door. So typically what they're doing is that they are sending this radio signals and also powering these uh, stickers, and it's reflecting back this uh, information. So if when you go and make the payment uh, at the counter, they disable these uh, RFID tags, but if you don't sort of like make the payment, then sort of like this communication happens and it raises an alarm. So backscatter in that respect, if you talk about RFID, it's like one of the most widely used IoT uh, system in some respect, and it's used in our day-to-day -day life, right from identification to, for example, inventory, and for example, even, uh, uh, in some countries, uh, some of the uh, tickets are also issued like RFID tags. So uh, these tags typically are in the sticker form factor without batteries and they are sort of like can be placed on objects. So it's, it's a very good example of uh, backscatter being used in our day-to-day -day life. But of course, this RFID has its own challenge. So uh, it's not really useful for some of the applications that we have talked about, like uh, for example, things like wearable and fit, uh, fitness uh, fitness sensors. And the reason is that typically RFIDs require this big uh, reader device to sort of like give them uh, uh, this uh, radio wave signal to power them and as well as to receive information. And typically the range has been quite limited to few meters. And, and then also this reader is typically thousands of dollars in cost. So even though the tax are cheap, but you need this like expensive uh, big device that sort of like uh, provides power. So because of this reason, uh, RFID has not been used as much for uh, Internet of Thing application other than some of uh, the inventory and other applications where uh, uh, it has found its niche. So this is where uh, one of the work that I did uh, uh, during my PhD studies was to actually uh, uh, look into designing a very low power wireless communication system that actually overcomes some of the limitation of uh, RFID system. So this was actually a work that I presented in uh, Census, which is one of the flagship conferences in sensor systems. And, and uh, so this was a hardware that I had designed, which at a peak power consumption of about 70 microwatts, it could actually wirelessly communicate and it, it could uh, reflect signals coming from, let's say like a Wi-Fi access point or your computer. And, uh, and the key thing was that it was able to communicate to distances of kilometers. So while RFID was able to communicate few meters, we were able to sort of like get to the point where we were able to communicate up to kilometers by just reflecting or absorbing signals that are already there in the environment. So uh, it was actually quite interesting for me to do these experiments. So at that time I was a PhD student. So this is basically a river in uh, Uppsala. So we started to do some of the experiments here. And uh, uh, so here basically is one of the backscatter attacks. And here I am about a kilometer away from the setup. And I was still able to receive uh, the backscatter transmissions. and. Uh, we never anticipated that we'll get this far range. So we ran out of sort of like the space to do next to uh, the river. So we actually then took the entire setup to uh, just outside of the city. We kept the backscatter tag and the carrier emitting device on top of the hill. And, and then I was walking like uh, three, four kilometers just to try to see how far we could actually go in terms of the communication range. Typically I would set things up and then uh, collect link metrics. And by the time I would sort of like finish, it would already be quite late in the night. One good thing about Sweden is that uh, in summers, typically you just have two or three hours of uh, night. So 
in winters you have like 20 uh, 18 20 hours of uh, darkness but in summers it's totally opposite so you have just few hours of uh, right so typically even if you are at 10 uh, it's it can be quite bright so in some respect uh, it was actually quite fun to do these experiments so if you look at, for example, uh, the system, we called it Loria. Uh, it was sort of like several orders of magnitude better than what existed. And the best thing was that it just used off the shelf components. So if any one of you are sort of like interested in designing electronics, so I think just send me an email and you can just uh, buy a bunch of components and put together a Loria tag. And you could actually do these experiments with reflecting and uh, absorbing uh, ambient signals. So, uh, in that respect, it was actually uh, uh, one of the instrumental system and that of course also got inter interest of a lot of uh, different people, including companies such as ABB. And it also overturned the notion that backscatter is just a short range mechanism. And this was actually important because once you sort of like open this possibility that by just reflecting absorbing signals, you can communicate at hundreds of meter or even higher uh, range, it throws open so many applications that you can support. For example, just think about having sensors in your farm that are transmitting, uh, let's say, the information about the soil to uh, base station located uh, in the uh, uh, at, uh, at some distance away from these sensors. So it, it opened up a lot of new application scenarios. So let's just look at, for example, this uh, chart that uh, the table that we had looked at. So the, the transmitter that I had developed consumed about 35 micro amperes. So if you sort of like to look at uh, the, I think this, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, have the, I think uh, I'm missing that table, but if you estimate, you will basically figure out that the, 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 the you could actually have this flexible battery and coin cell last for a much significant time period uh, by actually having this backscatter system. So what's the other implication of uh, having a very low power wireless transmitter that now you can actually have these devices that don't even have batteries. So you could actually have these devices operate on different energy source that are already available in the environment. So if you just look at your room itself, you can harvest energy from the ambient radio waves that are already there. So like things like Wi-Fi, television, cellular signal. So you can sort of like leach energy from these uh, sources, but there is also, for example, light. So you can have a small solar cell, harvest energy, or even things like, for example, this, uh, does anyone of you know what this is? So it is a T, what? Exactly, so it is one of the TG elements and they have become actually quite efficient. So I have one of the these elements in my uh, office and it is so efficient that if I just keep it, let's say between my palm, it has enough energy that you can power an LED. And typically LEDs are actually uh, quite uh, power consuming. Your microcontrollers and uh, other components on the IoT devices are much lower in power consumption. So they are becoming quite efficient so you can harvest heat or you can even sort of like get energy from strain. So if you have one of the piezoelectric elements, so by just having this mechanical stress, you can harvest energy. So the reason why backscatter sort of like makes this uh, possible is that the amount of typically energy that you harvest from these sources is very little. So if you have like this traditional uh, uh, wireless radios that are part of your devices, it's usually will not be able to give you enough uh, uh, energy to uh, transmit often. But with backscatter, it sort of like throws open all this possibility to power your IoT devices. So one of the systems that I developed with my uh, student at uh, Andreas was something that we call battery-free visible light sensing. So in this system, we had like, a, uh, this is a very low light level. So it is a few hundred lux. And we had a small solar cell that was actually harvesting energy from this light. And then it was reflecting FM signal. So this is basically, if you can see, this is a tall uh, antenna, which is used for FM uh, transmission. And we were sort of like reflecting FM signals, powering the entire sensor from the energy harvested from so small solar cell and performing some machine learning task on the computer. And it could sort of like detect hand gestures that were being performed. And the entire device was just uh, operating at less than uh, 50 microwatts of power consumption. So, the, so the entire system was just uh, uh, it was sensing the change in the light level when you sort of like perform gesture using a solar cell and using the same solar cell for harvesting energy and reflecting FM signals for performing wireless communication. 
And uh, this is another project that was from University of Washington, where I, I think battery based cell phone is sort of like not the, I think it's uh, maybe a bit misleading, but they were able to demonstrate by using this backscatter mechanism that they could have this device that was sort of like uh, able to transmit and receive audio information and have the entire device powered from energy harvested from radio waves. Charging your phone ever again. Ever again. But of course, it's a bit misleading, but I think uh, but it demonstrates the potential of the technology to actually have a device that can both receive and transmit audio while just harvesting small amount of energy from the ambient radio waves. So of course, Backscatter was about uh, transmission. So your wireless device also has to receive. So how do you perform reception? So I'm just going to quickly go through one of the systems that I had developed, which was uh, something called Edison. So this was presented at Mobisys. So we sort of like use this uh, uh, solar cell to harvest energy, but also be able to receive information. So typically if you have light and if you flicker it at a rate of let's say over hundred Hertz, that means that you are turning it on and off at a rate that is greater than hundred Hertz. Then you would not be able to see that the light is sort of like being turned on, on and off. And typically you can have this light turned on and off like this at a frequency even of few megahertz. So what it allows you to do is that you can actually encode information in this flickering. So you will, as a human, not see the flickering, but there is data being transmitted in light. And that you can then have circuitry to receive uh, information. And so we designed the system where we sort of like used a solar cell to receive light uh, transmission and had a backscatter for uplink. And we sort of like designed the system which harvested energy from solar cell and could also sort of like receive through the same light, but uh, then then communicate using backscatter module. So this sort of like shows how the energy flow happens. So you store the energy on a capacitor and that powers the rest of the components on the device. So uh, one of the innovations that we did was to use solar cell for uh, receiving uh, information. So typically solar cells uh, we use for harvesting energy, but we showed that you can actually use it for uh, reception as well. and. Uh, the entire system sort of like uh, was um, uh, able to sort of like uh, receive and transmit without requiring batteries and uh, and it it uh, it was sort of like done together with this institute in spain that does a lot of work in the wireless networking uh, area so these are like all examples of systems that uh, are designed in uh, research but they require a lot of engineering skills as you see and they sort of like show you what might be coming in the future where the devices don't require batteries so the so in some respect, it was a system that had light and then you were transmitting and then reflecting these signals to communicate back. So, so of course, uh, this all was something in the research domain. So I think for you, uh, I think if you, uh, if some of you are interested to work in this area, it has also uh, had a lot of commercial interest. So I myself at some point was very interested to think about doing a startup and there are other startups that have also come out uh, uh, that are in this space and uh, they're always looking for uh, like, uh, good engineers and uh, students. So I think you can look at uh, uh, from your own perspective as well. So this is actually a startup that uh, was spun out by uh, my uh, advisor and other uh, folks at Michigan. And uh, this company is called Cubebox and they have designed these small autonomous sensors that are as small as like uh, the tip of your uh, pencil. This is another company called Will IoT and they have designed Bluetooth stickers that harvest energy from radio waves and communicate by Bluetooth. And then of course, uh, it can also be in form factor of let's say like a glass. So I'll just play this video from this company and this company actually has raised several hundred million dollars of VC funding. And you can actually, if you're interested, you can order their developer kit and you can have these stickers that are harvesting energy from radio waves and wirelessly communicating. So I'll just play this video.
So all of these companies actually have come out in last few years. So when we started to work in this area, many of them were spun off. They raised a lot of money. And now you actually have these devices. If you are interested, you can just go and uh, buy them uh, 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 and sort of like have them delivered. So it's a very interesting area. And that sort of like brings me to my uh, project that I'm uh, bootstrapping here. And uh, I will be very happy if some of you are interested in this space. Uh, you can just send me an email and we could actually potentially look at working together. So. Uh, so this project is something called Stickers. So it stands for Sticker Computer. So it's a multi-university project uh, that uh, uh, I'm starting at NUS. And uh, it sort of like has this vision of being able to design sticker form factor computers that can communicate at a very long distances. So one of the things that we uh, sort of like if you, because at the end I'm still an academic and uh, I do research. So it's not like, while well, we do a lot of engineering, but it has a strong research component. So there are several challenges in having devices such as uh, one we showed from this company called Will IoT. First, they have very short communication range. Typically, you are talking about few meters of range, but there are also a host of other system issues, right from security to looking at the privacy of data. So there are a whole bunch of issues, including how do you for, for, form networks of these devices. So that sort of like is the focus of this project. And this project actually builds on a system that I had developed uh, uh, during the last two years, something called we call Judo. So this is actually the setup of uh, the Baxcat experiments I did. And there we, one of the constraints was that if you see the video, so this is on top of the hill. So while we were reflecting and absorbing the signal, but we actually had, uh, in some respect, we had this like a uh, device that was generating the radio waves like a meter or a few meters away from the backscatter attack. So while we are reflecting and absorbing wireless signal, but there was a device that was generating the strong signal and then you were reflecting and absorbing. And that has been sort of like one of the constraints with many of the backscatter systems. So you get this kilometers range, but you need this like powerful device, like few meters or 10 meters away that provides you the signal that you are then reflecting and absorbing. So that was one of the challenges. And that's, this is where sort of like I designed something called Judo, which actually allows you to have these wireless devices even more than 100 meters away. And you can still have range of about 100 meters. And it has these three parameters, uh, which is like greater than 100 kbps uh, bit rate, less than 100 microwatts of power, which is at least an order of magnitude lower than the best chip in the market right now. And over 100 meters of range uh, from the emitter device, the device that is providing you wireless signal that you're reflecting and the receiver. And the key is that it actually is sort of like based on uh, these diodes called Isaki or tunnel diodes. Has any one of you heard the term tunnel diodes before? So this is actually something uh, you should go and read about. So this is uh, Leo Isaki. He got Nobel Prize in Physics in 1973 for discovering tunnel diodes. And these uh, tunnel diodes uh, were discovered half a century back. They became quite obsolete because uh, in some respect they were ahead of the time. So these devices actually because of uh, an effect called quantum tunneling demonstrate something called negative resistance region. So this, without going into too much detail what negative resistance region is, it gives them like a lot of fascinating properties. And for different reasons, uh, this device became obsolete uh, in 70s because in 70s uh, low power was, uh, we didn't have receiver that could actually make use of the, of the signal that was being generated by tunnel diode because they were generating very weak signal. But now 50 years later, our receiver technology has caught up that we can actually use these devices. So a lot of my work recently has been about uh, building these uh, or getting these diodes uh, back again uh, and demonstrating that they have all these great capabilities for uh, low power communication. And this is the negative resistance region that I talked about. So if you just look at the IV curve, if you sort of like increase the voltage around it, it has this like weird area where even though you are increasing the bias voltage, the current actually drops. And it gives us a lot of interesting properties. I think for students who are in, from the E background, I, uh, just send me an email and I can talk hours about tunnel diodes. So uh, so it, it was actually quite uh, the difficult to procure. So you cannot just go on DigiKey or one of your uh, like electronic stores and buy tunnel diodes because they have ob become obsolete. So in some respect, it has become my hobby to collect these. Uh, I have. Uh, I was actually buying a lot of them from places like Ukraine because they were used a uh, lot in like even military equipments. But now, of course, that was pre-war uh, era. But uh, many of them actually even felt like they were kept under a cellar for like decades. So uh, these tunnel diodes uh, have long shelf life and they're difficult to procure, but uh, uh, it, it's uh, they have very uh, fascinating property for IoT devices. 
So this was some uh, more experiments that I did and we were able to get 100, 100 meters of range. And this is uh, back in uh, Sweden. And if you just compare it to, let's say, the technologies that uh, exist right now. So have any one of you heard of a wireless standard called LoRa? LoRa, okay, there are, yeah, okay, there are some people. So, so, in, so it's not uh, as high range as LoRa, but uh, it sort of like has a space that it, uh, it has much, like at least two orders of magnitude lower power consumption. And uh, I think Bluetooth, we know Zigbee. Have you heard of uh, Zigbee as a protocol? So. So typically, I think uh, this sort of like the transmitter has a very unique space in terms of communication range and it's uh, energy per bit. It's uh, one of the lowest uh, uh, in the, if you compare it with the commercial devices. And what it sort of like allows is that it allows me to sort of like talk about this vision, which I have, which is to design sensors, which are in the form factor of a sticker. So we are not going beyond classic, like you are just sensing and communicating, but we are talking about having small computers that are in the form factor of a sticker that are harvesting energy from the environment and by building on systems such as judo can actually communicate over distances of 100 meters. And uh, I, I, I think uh, the judo is sort of like almost seven years of my research in making. So I feel like it's an important step that actually makes this vision possible. And uh, I have this uh, famous Chinese uh, proverb from this, the journey of thousand miles begin with one step. And I think it sort of like can go much beyond some of the commercial products that exist from companies such as Will IoT, RFID, and it can sort of like allow us to have this vision of uh, computers that are embedded in the environment that are communicating over long distances and sort of like bridging this uh, physical and uh, digital uh, divide. So that's uh, my last uh, slide. So all of these projects actually require, as you see, a lot of uh, uh, engineering effort and uh, my own background is uh, quite interdisciplinary, even though I'm in a computer science department, but I often collaborate with the faculty and uh, students who are in electronics and communication. So students from all of these backgrounds are very welcome. I think if you're interested in these projects, I think uh, just send me an email. And there is a lot of potential for impact. So we are not only talking about academic papers, but as you see that there have been startups that have spun out about the, around some of these work. There is a lot of interest from industry. Uh, I've received several grants, including my advisors from uh, different uh, industry, and they are investing a lot in this area. It's actually part of uh, the emerging 6G standard. Uh, so low power sensing and communication is actually one of the core sort of like pillars of upcoming 6G standards. So it's also great if you are, let's say, looking to go into industry. And uh, of course, uh, it's not only sort of like uh, that you uh, are going to do research, but there are also a lot of engineering uh, uh, roles also that exist. So if you are interested, I think just send me an email. Uh, this is my homepage. It's, uh, uh, you can find a lot of these research work there. And, uh, I, and then we can sort of like talk about uh, uh, these projects in detail and where you could contribute. So with this, I will uh, conclude this uh, talk. So if you have any question, I think I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. So do you guys have any question? It's not, it, that's a sort of like, uh, uh, it's, it's not a sort of like uh, reflecting LoRa signals. So it's uh, doing something called 2FSK. So uh, that system is not uh, like using LoRa as a standard, even though there have been like demonstrations where you can have backscatter systems as uh, which are, generating LoRa signals, but we are not uh, sort of like uh, using LoRa. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah, so LoRa is the name of the system that I had developed in, uh, but that was based on Backscatter, but it's not using LoRa, uh, LoRa as a standard. Oh, okay. so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there, there have been like from this uh, group at University of Washington that they have been able to sort of like develop Backscatter based LoRa transmitters as well. So. Uh, my own research didn't use LoRa, but there have been like works that have demonstrated within the community. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think if you're at three kilometer, no, I think if you're at a three kilometer, definitely um, it was not like very, the, we actually went through a car and then we were, you, you will be surprised on how well the reception happens, but uh, it's, 
I think where the constraint of that system was that you needed to have this like powerful source, like few 10 meters away from the backscatter tag. So there was a source that was generating these uh, radio signals. And then there was a backscatter tag that was battery free that was reflecting signals. Uh, and then we had a receiver three kilometers away. So at three kilometers or, or let's say uh, at a distance of about two to three kilometers, you don't need to be very directional. You will be able to receive uh, unless you are like next to a tree or something, you will be able to receive quite uh, well. But the constraint was that you had to be close to this source. And that's mm -hmm. where we sort of like designed the system Dudo, which actually overcame some of those constraints. Yeah, so I, I think uh, those are like uh, good questions in that respect that if you are uh, at the end, uh, there is, let's say, uh, if you have a router, let's say you are harvesting energy from a uh, Wi-Fi signal. So there is a sort of like limited energy that is being radiated. And if you have more antennas and sort of like they are drawing energy as well. So it affects the, the propagation of radio waves and it might have a negative impact on other devices. So those are like kind of questions uh, that would be interesting to look at even from the research perspective that how do you actually have like a lot of devices harvesting energy from radio signals without impacting each other. So, but definitely it can have an effect. So I think if you have too many devices sort of like harvesting energy, it will have also effect on, for example, uh, your reception on your uh, computer. So if you're harvesting energy from these radio waves, but you're using the same radio waves for, let's say, communication on your computer. So it can also affect uh, the quality of, let's say, uh, communication on your computer as well. So, but those are like kind of the problems that uh, once these systems are sort of like start to become, uh, let's say, real, that we are sort of like using them uh, in our day-to-day -day life, that those are the kind of problems that I think uh, we have started to look at in terms of addressing them. What would be the best way to deploy them so that you can deliver energy, but also ensure a good quality communication? So, yep. Um, so, Moria requires that there's like a external form of like the uh, NMWay to like uh, and to like uh, do the backscatter. Yep. For yep. these like emitters, uh, are they like very directed or can they do like a, like a I'm thinking like a 20 meter square radius kind of thing? No, uh, I think with the Loria, we didn't have, we had an omnidirectional antenna. So it was actually uh, radiating uh, in sort of like a sort of like uniform pattern around it. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I think in some respect, I think if you want, you can make some of these links uh, directional and extend the range even further. So I, uh, but when, what do you mean by 20 meter? Uh, yeah, this I'm, I'm thinking like, for example, let's say we have like a marathon going to a very rural area. I mm -hmm. want to like enable the use of these devices on my like, runner. Yeah, I think you can actually uh, potentially cover it, uh, into, uh, let's say a significant portion of the region with the emitter. Uh, in, in some respect, I think your range might be limited because at the end, uh, the range from the backscatter transmitter is a function of how strong the signal is at that uh, device. So if you sort of like are going to use one emitter, then the range might be limited. But I think one of the directions that actually some people have looked at is having multiple of these emitters. And then they, you could sort of like generate enough signal that it covers a large area and then coordinating them. So these are all great questions because that's uh, what actually some of the research topics in this area are looking at. How do you deploy a large number of emitter devices or uh, these devices that are generating radio waves and coordinating them so that it doesn't sort of like uh, affect other devices or you can maintain a good quality of service. Yeah. So any further questions? Two backscatter devices. Yeah, we have, we have done experiment with multiple devices and uh, uh, typically what we do is like we, we can do things which are like you have like two wireless devices that they don't interfere with each other, right? Or you can have, let's say your phone or uh, 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 this uh, computer operate uh, together. So in similar way, we can also have like similar medium access control mechanisms. Like uh, one uh, way that I have done previously is to put them on separate frequencies. So uh, things uh, have you do you know about things like FDMA and uh, like yeah tra so you just put them in separate transmission band or make them transmit at not at the same time and uh, I, I think if you take any wireless networking course typically they have this sort of like uh, lecture about uh, medium access control so uh, these devices can have similar mechanisms and that can allow them to sort of like have uh, multiple devices operate on the same. Uh, there are challenges uh, in introducing those uh, mechanisms, but it's possible and it has been done. So, yep. Mm -hmm.
like you cannot transmit a certain band because you don't want to like mm. re- reuse the possibility of like nine 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 calls going through, right? Mm. But like when we are absorbing like FM waves using our backscatter, is there any risk of like that? Th- that's actually a hack in the, uh, because it's a hacker uh, this thing. So uh, uh, the regulations actually don't control what is reflected or absorbed. Because uh, regulations might say, of course, some of our experiments were done in ISM band where we are allowed to transmit. But if let's say you're reflecting TV signals or FM band, typically you require license to transmit on those bands. Uh, but uh, the government doesn't control if you're reflecting or absorbing because your environment is already reflecting absorbing signals. So technically it goes around all the regulation and they haven't still caught up to regulating. It's like AI now that it is going be in a certain direction. And uh, before, I think governments usually only regulate when things sort of like build a certain momentum. So I think we haven't reached that point, but maybe at some point they might regulate. So, so we are not going to, yeah, it's quite late. So we are not going to have further questions. So uh, thanks Prof Ashni uh, for giving this a uh, very, very interesting talk. So yeah, please. Thank you very much. So, um, as usual, um, we're going to thank our sponsor, Jane Street. Um, sorry. Yeah. Jane Street, okay, for the food and drinks, okay. And, um, yeah, there's a feedback form for this week. So, feel free to fill it out. And, um... We appreciate your feedback and we'll do better from your responses. And yeah, and 